First, uh, thanks, for, thanks for inviting me. And uh, I'll keep getting these emails about, um, you should also uh, make sure to bring a junior member of your lab to, uh, to, to the workshop. And I thought, well, I am the junior member. <laughs> so, so thank you again for, for inviting me and also allowing me to give this talk as well, which I think that uh, is courageous on your part. <laughs> so today I'll also be talking about uh, learning intermediate level representations of form and motion from, from natural scenes, from natural movies. And while the, the title of the workshop has to do with high level representations, I think that actually intermediate representations are a big missing component in the way we will understand these higher level visual areas. And there's a big sort of gap in our understanding. And you know, that's kind of evidenced by a lot of the work that we've already heard here today. So I'll try to move you towards uh, some of the work we've been doing that tries to elucidate and maybe provide some predictions about what uh, these intermediate level representations might look like. So here's my, my standard slide of the, the visual system. And so I don't, I don't put this up here to remind you of where all the visual areas are, but I already put it up here just to kind of convey to you the, the, the scope of the problem that we're facing here. And I think that, uh, so we certainly made a tremendous amount of progress um, in you know, trying to describe these different visual areas, even just being able to draw this, this diagram up here is you know, a big accomplishment. But I think if the, the goal here is to really provide explanations for each and every single one of these, these visual areas, well, that becomes a very daunting task. And I think that's the goal that the, the field of visual neuros, neuroscience should have, is, is detailed models and descriptions of each of the visual, visual areas and all of the visual areas we see here. And I think um, theory actually should provide a very uh, unique tool in trying to uh, determine the properties in these different visual areas. And what I particularly mean are predictive visual theories, so predictive models that provide possible explanations for each one of these visual areas. And that's the type of model I think are, are going to be the most useful in the progress that we're going to try to make over explaining each of these visual areas. So models come in all different shapes and sizes, and so you might ask, like, well, what kind of models are we looking for? What kind of models would be good ones to try to uh, propose or try to introduce. And I think, um, you know, looking at uh, much of the work that's out there, I think um, a specific model related to, to V1 is actually kind of a very nice example of, of a type of model that would be quite useful. And not just simply like the Gabor function model of primary visual cortex. And when I mean Gabor function, I mean it in the, the very broadest sense of, the, of that concept. So I don't mean to get into details about whether we should have logarithmic or linear scaling or it should be complex or, or just real. I just mean it in terms of you know, localized, uh, localized filter with orientation and, and uh, selective in space as well. And I also don't mean to, to say that this is the definitive model of V1 by any means. And there's certainly huge uh, aspects that we need to introduce and add to this model. But I think it is also important to remember that it allows us to, to pivot essentially from this concept and say, Right now, we've got this, this uh, Gabor function idea of, of what V1 is doing, what, what early visual systems are doing. And we can kind of begin to pick out what the, what the, what the things are that are wrong about that, that model. And we can be, begin to propose experiments that test those, uh, test those boundaries of our knowledge. And it was, allows us to kind of like put a stake in the ground and move, move from there. And I also think that like, the Gabor function model of uh, visual cortex has provided an incredible amount of utility as well. So I think it's touched every single area of, of visual neuroscience. So from you know, receptive field descriptions in, in primary visual cortex, like, like Dario Ringosh's work and trying to map you know, Gabor functions to the receptive fields that are estimated, to uh, some work that we've seen from people here about uh, trying to look at higher visual areas and mapping functions in the spaces of like Gabor filter outputs, for example. Also in, uh, in fMRI, encoding and decoding models of voxels often, and we'll see uh, talks today, or uh, maybe today, Jack's talking today, about uh, models that are essentially have as their substrate Gabor-like pyramids that allow us to predict quite well uh, decoding and encoding models of, of different voxels. Also in, in psychophysics, the Gabor function seems to be touching every single paradigm in psychophysics, whether it's detection or, or thresholds or even you know, contour integration. Each one of these uh, psychophysical paradigms seems to have the Gabor kind of uh, uh, in there. 
also even in, in computational models. So for example, the, some of the models that uh, Tommy talked about in the last talk have literally baked into the bottom layer, baked into that bot V1 layer, a parameterized Gabor function that is just given as, as what the, the first layers are doing. And also similar to some of the stuff that Eero uh, uh, talked about as well. So I think this is kind of uh, interesting in that this very s simplistic model, which there are many details I'm not you know, talking about and there's much to be discussed there, but this very simple type of model where it's uh, a low dimensional parameterization of this uh, transfer from pixels into some other representation has had such incredible uh, utility. And then I think it's very natural to ask, well, well, can we actually come up with a Gabor function for intermediate vision? So could we actually come up with some low dimensional uh, function that explains, you know, in broad strokes, what we might find in, in intermediate vision. And that's what um, I'll try to pre present to you some uh, initial results that, that we have in this, in this direction. So this work is with, uh, with Bruno Olshausen, and naturally the approach we're gonna be taking is the efficient coding approach. And the basic idea goes that the, the brain learns efficient representations of the sensory environment. The sensory environment is highly structured and therefore, by constructing efficient models of the structure of the, of the environment, we can predict representations that the brain has produced, has learned. And the, the work that we, we often turn to, and, uh, and is a good example of this, of this formulation, is the, the work by, by Bruno Olshausen and, and David Field, and related to other works, for example, like Babel and Schnowski, of sparse coding. And here in sparse coding, this is uh, my, one, my one slide explaining sparse coding. So we've got uh, an image patch over here, and the idea of the model is that we're gonna construct this image patch from these bases, these uh, different functions that have their own receptive fields. And this can be this linear weighting with each, co each basis function has its own uh, coefficient that's adapted for each image that comes in to the model. And the sparse coding idea is that we try to learn these A's. So this big A here refers to all the little gray level values that you see in this, in this function here. And so the learning process is you start these, these things out at random, they look like white noise patches, and we allow them to converge with a very specific constraint. And that's we, that we want the outputs of these U variables to be, to be sparse, to be cartotic, to be uh, peaked at zero with heavy tails compared to a Gaussian. And the miraculous thing is that you find that from those white noise looking patches, they converge to things that look like Gabor functions. All right, so that's the very important part here is that from this computational idea of, of stating a specific probabilistic model, we can go through this learning algorithm and find things that look like Gabor functions. And that's of course interesting because we find things that look like Gabor functions in the brain. So this gives us this very nice example that this methodology might allow us to produce things that look like maybe the candidate Gabor function for intermediate vision as well. But unfortunately, as you can see here, like sparse coding is not quite enough to get us towards intermediate vision. So these, these functions, they're you know, localized in space and orientation and, and spatial frequency, but they're not getting us anything that we know from experimentation that uh, is likely to be a good candidate for, for intermediate vision. They have little abstraction, they don't have invariance. They're certainly not getting towards you know, object representations. So we need some more, more ideas here. And we borrow you know, as much as we can from the, from the community and it, there's a lot of great ideas, especially related to you know, hierarchy and invariance and factorization. And we're gonna go over a model here that, uh, that captures many of these things. And we've talked a lot about, you know, in this, in this workshop so far about hierarchy and, and, and invariance, but uh, not quite so much about factorization. And what we mean by factorization are related to ideas that extend back to, um, well, to, to Borrow and, uh, and uh, Tenenbaum, actually, and their idea of like visual layers. Uh, but what we think about in factorization is that the, the important information that's out there in the visual world is, is tied together in the visual input and it needs to be pulled apart, it needs to be factored apart for good representations of, of visual scenes and visual uh, movies. 
So certain factors might be like the surfaces in the, in the world, the, the poses of individual objects and the identity of those objects, and also the, the motions that those objects are undergoing. So we like these representations that are able to, to tease apart and to rip apart from those pixels that we get in into things that are more specific to motions and specific to, to form, for example. So here's a, it's an overview slide of, of what this model kind of looks like. And it's hierarchical and it's gonna build invariants and it's gonna do factorization. And down here at the bottom, we've got what's analogous to the sparse coding model. So here we have this, this image down at the bottom. We have these A functions, which we'll learn. These U's, which are gonna be linear weightings on the A's. And here's where we begin to add some more, more components here. So these A's and these phi's, these are gonna be the, the beginnings of this factorization process. We're gonna begin to factor apart the sparse coding variables into two different, and, um, two different variables that are related to form and related to motion. And I'll show you how, how we do that. But these A's are gonna be invariant to local changes and we're gonna uh, adapt the A's and the, the parameters of this uh, stage such that these A's are invariant. And then the, the phase variables, these phi variables, are gonna subsume all of the, the specifics of where those edges are in the world and how those edges move about the world. And what this factorization allows us to do is it takes apart what was, what was tied together in those U variables and puts them into form information and, and motion information. And having those two, two things factored apart makes it very easy then to learn hierarchical representations that determine the statistical properties of those populations in turn. And that's what we see here in this hierarchy, where we can then build on this factorization to learn more abstract properties that begin to resemble things like form information. And in this other side, if we begin to build uh, you know, these bases, these D functions, in the space of these phase transformations and how the, all the little edges in the world move together, we begin to get out abstract uh, representations of motion. So let's look at now how this, uh, this first layer begins to factorize uh, these sparse, co sparse coefficients and why we built in some of the ideas that we did. So if you look at, so the contrast isn't great here, but uh, if you look at this, this movie here, it's very simple, it's just a, a sharp edge moving across the, the visual field. We can begin to trace out how coefficients from Gabor functions look as that edge moves across the visual field. And this observation uh, was first made by uh, Apu Veronin and pointed out um, how these coefficients seem to have like this amplitude structure where there's sort of like a, as he called it, some, a bubble uh, aspect where you have a slowly changing variable and a quickly changing variable inside of it. And that amplitude is like the, the distance from the center here. So as that edge becomes in the middle of that, of the visual field over this receptive field, the amplitude is relatively constant, but the phase quickly changes. And so the amplitude is invariant to the exact position of that, of that edge and the phase is equivariant. And what we mean by equivariant is that it moves with the edge. And that, that's very important because the movement with the edge is related to the motion. And so this is the, the key thing that we've done here that we're gonna build into the model is this factorization between the amplitudes and the phases of these low dimensional spaces. So here's the, the sparse coding model. Again, this is the same equation we just saw before where these A's are the, the functions we've learned in the past that look like these Gabor functions, and the U's are those coefficients. And we're gonna add another, another layer here that factors apart pairs of these, of these U coefficients. And the math, is, the math is here. Don't need to go into the details, but more or less we have a, a common amplitude that modulates a pair of these functions and a common phase variable that modulates the angle uh, between them. And again, we're gonna impose these priors on the A coefficients such that they're, that they're sparse, that they're cartotic, and that we're gonna allow the phase variables to actually be quickly changing to allow them to subsume all the motions and the dynamics in, in the visual world. 
We can also cast this as a, as a probabilistic model where we want to do reconstruction of the images. We want those A's to be sparse, and we want the A's also to be uh, slowly changing through time. So we put this, this L2 penalty on the, the amplitude derivative. And we play the same game again that we did for sparse coding. And given this, this probabilistic model, we're going to learn what these A basis functions should look like. So we start them off with random values. They just look like white, white noise to start off with. And through the learning process, we adapt these A's such that we can satisfy these, these constraints over here that they should be sparse, that the small A's should be sparse and, and also slow through time. So a great way to understand what the model has learned is to actually generate from this model. So because it's a generative model, we can actually generate images from it. And what I've done here is I've taken out two of the, the learned first layer bases. So there's this paired, uh, paired functions here. And these are the ones that, that are learned. And so lo and behold, they look like, uh, look like a Bohr's. And what I can do then is I can produce a, a time course of this variable A. So here, this is through time. And this is gonna be the value of that A variable. And I'm just gonna turn it on and then turn it off. And then I can also ramp up this phase variable through time. And if you, if you do this, what you get out are these, these motions through the, the visual field. And the nice thing here is that this model is then, as I said before, kind of factored out the, the presence of this edge. So when that A variable turns on and when it turns off, it's determining if this edge structure is present or not. And it's also, even though constant over this, this period here, it's also, also changing quite a bit because of the phase variable changes. And so that means that the A variable is actually invariant to these local changes in the, the visual field. What's more is that the, the phase variable, as it changes, as it goes, moves along this ramp here, it's related to the exact position of the, of the edge within the visual field. And its, it's a slope, or its, it's a first order time derivative, is related to how fast that, that edge is moving. So these uh, two components we're gonna utilize in these, these next layers. And here's just the, the whole population of these. So I think this, this model is like 20 by 20 image patches and, and 400 of these pairs. So this is more or less doing what I showed on the last slide, but for the whole population of these, of these functions. And so you see again that we get out this tiling of orientation and spatial position. So let's say you know, this, this result had come up 50 years ago. And so we didn't know anything about the, the brain. We didn't, well, we didn't know much about Gabor functions. Let's say we, this, thing, this idea hadn't been, been around. And we could look, look and see, say, like, well, could we come up with a low parameter function that, that describes you know, all of these, these things that look like quite complicated? Well, you know, of course we can, and that's the, that's the, the Gabor function. I just want to walk you through this methodology of how we've gone from learning these receptive fields in the pixel domain to fitting just Gabor functions. So we can take you know, those, those parameters in the model that we've learned, right? So we've learned essentially every single little weight in this huge array here. So here's like an array of uh, like 32 by 32, so that's like a thousand dimensions for each one of these, uh, each one of these bases. And then I can fit uh, a complex Gabor function to this estimated uh, basis. And so that's the, the fit down here. And so we get this great, uh, this great correspondence between just the low parameter Gabor function, the low parameter complex Gabor function, and what we've learned here. So this is, you know, by today's standards, this is trivial, right? But I just wanted to walk you through this, this methodology of how, you know, it could have been that we could have done this sparse coding thing first and then come up with the Gabor function. So we're gonna try to take this methodology and, and show what might be happen for second layers, for intermediate visual areas. So another thing we can do is we look at the whole population of these first layer functions in terms of those Gabor parameters. So because these Gabor parameters are, are low dimensional and they have these very nice um, you know, correspondences, so like the, the, this, the position and space of this, of this function, we can just represent as a dot here and its, its orientation and spatial frequency we can represent as a dot here in the, in the 2D, 4D plane. We can also represent all of the functions that we've learned. So each one of these dots is a different first layer function. And you can see here that there's this tiling of, of visual space. 
where you have dots at every single position, and there's this tiling of orientation and uh, spatial frequency. So this type of plot will be helpful in, in how we describe the, the second layer functions. So I just want to go over a few things about the, the model during inference. So what this, what this has done for us, again, by doing this factorization and teasing apart parts of the form and, and the motion information in this first layer. So here's that, like, that sharp edge sequence again. And if I infer those, those u variables and the a variables and the phi variables, those u variables are very fast changing and they're kind of, look kind of complicated and, and, uh, and jagged. But the, the amplitude of this, of this pair is, is very smoothly changing. And the phase variable is also smoothly changing. It's just this, this linear ramp here. So that's for that very sharp edge. But if you look at a natural you know, sequence from a, from a movie, such as a natural movie sequence, we see these same types of trajectories. So this is also holding in, uh, in natural scenes as well. So these very smooth dynamics uh, we're going to utilize in, this, in the second layer in a moment or two. Also, the, the first layer that we've constructed here uh, begins to linearize certain dependencies in, in the first layer, which were not explicitly uh, linear dependencies in, in uh, the original sparse coding coefficients. So I'm not going to go over this too much, but the, the basic idea is that there are you know, clear first order uh, dependencies between the phase derivatives of these different uh, values and also between the logarithms of these A's. And because of this first layer has this property of factoring out these, these different constituent components of the visual scene, it makes it quite natural to, to build models on the different components. And so here I'll build a model where it's just going to be a sparse coding model where we have now basis functions D. So before we had the basis functions, those big A's. And now we have these, these big D basis functions. And the coefficients are going to be W, where before they were U. And we're going to be modeling the, the phase derivative in this case. And we can also set this up as a, as a probabilistic model where we have a similar error in the, in the reconstruction term and also, again, just like sparse and, and slow dynamics on those, uh, those latent variables. And again, we're going to play the same game where we're going to adapt these D functions such that they match these constraints of the, the being sparse and being slow through time to the statistics of natural movies. So as we show natural movies, these Ds are going to learn functions such that they match the statistics of natural motions. So how are we going to describe these, these D functions D? Because they live, uh, as you see here, they're, they're actually in the space of the first layer. right? So there are, there are weights from the first layer to the second layer, which makes it non-trivial to show what the, the second layer has learned. But we can take advantage of the, the structure in that first layer to, to show what the second layer has learned. So again, like we can fit you know, these Gabor functions to the first layer and plot a dot for, for each one of these functions at its particular spatial position and spatial frequency position. And we can plot you know, a dot for each one of the, the first layer functions. And so there is a weight for each one of the, the second layer units, right? for each one of my second layer neurons, there's going to be a weight from that neuron to one of the first layer units. Right? So there's a weight for each one of these white dots here. And so it makes it very easy just to, to color each one of these dots based on that weight. And so that's what's, what's shown here, where you know, red are high weights and blue are, are uh, strong uh, negative weights. And this is a, this is a scheme I've adopted from, uh, from Young Harklin. And this is one of those learned functions in the second layer. And you can see that it has this quite rich structure in the, in the spatial frequency plane. But it's quite disordered in, in spatial position, in the weights, how the weights are organized in spatial position. So maybe people have some guesses as to what that, uh, that function might do. But uh, let's just go to the, the generations, and we'll become quite clear. So again, just as in the first layer, I can also generate movies by manipulating this, this W here. So I can take a static image. I can take the inferred amplitudes and inferred phases for that static image. And then I can turn on this W to perturb the phases to change the phase derivative through time such that we get out a movie that is matched to the pattern that this W unit has learned. And so this is one of those, those learned components here. <clears throat> 
and it has uh, this specific structure in the spatial frequency plane, and it's this, this like linear ramp here. And we can see that, the, that this is producing this, uh, I just need to stand back a little bit here, but uh, this nice motion in the visual field uh, in the vertical direction. And now we can kind of reason backwards and, and determine why that is. Well, it's because as we move away from this, the central point, we increase in spatial frequency. And in order to get coherent motion, we need to increase that faster phase precession for higher spatial frequencies. So we need to get all those phases to align and move at the same speed through time in order to get coherent motion. And so this pattern has been learned from, from natural scene statistics, from natural movies that we've shown the model. This, this basis function D has, has um, materialized. It's been learned from those statistics. And also, important thing to note is that, that this specific D basis function is, is global in the way it, it changes motion. So it's producing this, this global field motion over the entire visual field. And another very important aspect of this is that this component is actually invariant to the form information. Could you explain the frequency just one more time? Oh, sure. Uh, <clears throat> so in this plot, the, like the mean is at the, is at the middle. And as we go along this direction, we get to higher and higher spatial frequencies of vertical uh, horizontal orientation. And so as you go to higher uh, spatial frequencies, if I move a phase at a, at a, as a constant rate, the, the function is going to move a, a, um, a smaller degree, or a larger degree, actually, in space for, as I move up. So it, what I have to do is I have to, in order to get the um, motion to be coherent in the visual domain, I need to move each one of those phases at a rate proportional to the, um, uh, to the spatial frequency. Okay. And then notice also that there's, there's you know, zero change in the phase across this axis here. And that's related to like the aperture problem, where you have these uh, you know, vertical orientations, where you have motion in this direction. Uh, it's blind to that. So this function is also invariant to the form information. And we think this is a very you know, important aspect of a visual representation that you want to try to achieve. So I can throw down you know, any pattern here, infer the amplitudes and the, and the phases, and then just apply the same second layer basis function, and I get out the same exact motion. Right? So I factored apart the way things look from the way they move. And so this one component controls just the way they move, and that doesn't care about the way they look. So this is one of our learned components. And there are a number of others. So let me just show you a, a few other examples here. So here's one that, that was learned from, from natural scenes and does rotations. So it seems to do a rotation about you know, some, ax, some uh, fixed point right over here. And you can see that rotates the visual field back and forth. Here's another. Another one that does this type of dilation along, along this axis here. So you get a whole population of these, these functions that are working together to explain the natural motions in, in the world. And these patterns have these very interesting tiling properties. So the, the vast majority of the learned functions are actually translations of different directions and of different uh, spatial scales. So that's the, the vast majority of the, of the learned components are tiling um, the directions of, of motion and, and spatial positions, whether you go from, so across this, this axis, I'm showing a different uh, sizes in the spatial domain. So this is like a global field motion. This one's like specific to the upper right portion. This one's like very, very spatially localized. And they span different orientations, of course. So there's the, the vast majority of these, these types of components. So we move on now to the, learning components on the other side of, of the model, learning components on the, the A variables. And it's going to be very, very analogous setup here, where we're going to adapt a, a probabilistic model with a, an error term, and we're going to require those V variables now. These are our sparse coefficients in this form side of the model to be sparse. And we're going to 
adapt these things to natural movies to learn these B functions. We get out a whole different set of weights here. And admittedly, these are harder to describe. But this one, for example, seems to be uh, selected for collinearity in the, in the visual field. So you have these like high weights to, to, um, to first layer units that are all in this line here. And each one of those uh, units with a high weight is of the same orientation. And that orientation is collinear, actually, with the organization of those, those weights. So the second layer things seems to be grouping together uh, first layer orientation filters of different uh, spatial frequencies, right? So going from very low spatial frequencies to very high spatial frequencies, but of the same orientation in collinear in the, in the visual field. So we can also manipulate visual patterns here. I'm not en entirely convinced that this is, uh, is too compelling here, but what you can kind of see is that, for example, when I manipulate these static images according to this second layer component, for example, it accentuates this, this edge in the zebra or it erases it. And so that's happening because this, when I turn on this component, the amplitude of, these, of this edge is going to go much higher. And when I uh, make it negative, it's going to go much lower. And it's going to erase that, that uh, oriented edge structure there. So we get a whole different population of these uh, form-like components. So this, we get a whole population of these ones that are elongated. We get a population of these, these form components that represent what I think are um, like texture differentials or power differentials in the, in the first layer of visual field. So this one has, has very little organization, if at all, in orientation and spatial frequency. But it has this very distinctive like, lobed interaction in the, in the spatial domain. So what's happening is that it prefers to have you know, a texture pattern uh, in one side of this boundary and a very smooth pattern on the other side of, of the boundary, where it wants to have high uh, oriented edge power on one side and very low power on the other side. And again, we can kind of see how that, uh, how that materializes here. Here's another one. We learned a population of these guys, which seem to be uh, differential in, in orientation. So they have this, uh, this sort of cross, not, not orthogonal, but uh, this, this selectivity to this, this orientation difference. And they have a very particular type of uh, spatial pattern as well. As you can see, that the high positive ones are you know, a little bit more oriented in this direction, while the high negative ones are a little bit more oriented in this direction. And like again, in this pattern, if I show it this like checkerboard, it seems to, to pull out the one of the, the orientations, one of the structures in, in the different orientations. And here's a little depiction of, uh, of the type of diversity of, of this population and the different types of things you get out. So, so in these uh, components that are these like texture boundaries or uh, like power differentials, uh, you get ones of different positions. You know, this is like up at upper right, here's an upper left, and different orientations. You get these, like collinear components at different positions in the visual field and at different orientations. You get out these cross orientation guys at different positions and different orientations. So we're getting this whole tiling again in these, in these new domains. You also get out these, these functions that are a little bit more smooth through, through space and are just slightly um, orientation selective. All right, so we've got all these components. We've learned this, this really complicated model with, with literally millions, like millions of parameters here. And so the big question now is like, can we condense this thing into a simple model? So something that might be, you know, the Gabor function for intermediate vision. So uh, this is kind of a, a work in progress, and we've come up with a few candidate functions, and I'll show you the one I came up with on Monday. So here's what it what it looks like, and I showed you all these these smooth variations in you know, in these domains, in this first layer domain, in the xy and the, in the phase and the, and the radius. And so I want to describe a function that takes in, you know, xy, r, theta for each one of the j's, each one of the first layer components. So this can be a function on that. And the function, as I said, the one I came up with on Monday, is factored in, in the spatial coordinates in x and y times another function in just r, times another function in just theta. So let's look at, at each one of those components. So this first uh, component, this uh, spatial component, 
So let's see, so this is a, like a Gaussian and space and times a cosine. All right, so what is that? It's a Gabor, all right, great. So it's just a Gabor function in space. And here's the one in, in spatial frequency. So here's um, this like exponential times a cosine. So what is that again? That's a Gabor function, right? Okay. And here we go. So this one's a little bit, a little bit more tricky. Since we're in angular space, I can't really write down a Gabor function. So it's what I might call like an equivalent in, in angular space. So it's like the, the cosine squared components times uh, a cosine. So again, it's another Gabor function. All right, so I don't know if this is trivial or amazing, but that's what I have right now. All right, we've got a simple uh, decomposition of this function into just factorized Gabor functions in each one of the domains. And so we've effectively gone from this really complicated you know, structure I had to send my model off on GPUs learning for, for days to get the thing to converge, and I get these thousands of parameters, and at the end of the day, I've got this model that's going to be 16 parameters, okay? So for each one of those second layer functions, it's going to be 16 parameters. And now I'll show you just, just how well we do with, with these parameters. So here's, here's an example. This is one of these, these global functions that's uh, uh, direction selective. So this is one of the motion uh, functions. And here's this, this scatter plot between the two. So here's if I fit that, that 16 dimensional second layer Gabor function to this function, and here's, here's the fit. So it's near, it's near dead on. Here's another example. In this case, you know, it's, high, it's localized in, in space, so it has this, um, this tuning up here in the upper left, and then the fit also is able to achieve this, this tuning as well as the uh, direction selectivity. And we get a very nice uh, correlation, of course. Here's another one where it's, it's uh, even more localized in space, and we get this selectivity, and so the fit, again, matches quite well. And here's a, one of a different type. Maybe not quite as, quite as high of a match, but still quite quite compelling in, in how, uh, how similar these functions turn out to be. So there's some, some little details we need to, to work on in this, this type of function. Here's one that's more, more smooth in space and has some spatial frequency uh, selectivity. And again, this function is able to capture that type of, of pattern. Here's another one, which is, again, more smooth in space, but uh, more orientation selective. And here's one of those cross orientation uh, functions. So again, we're able to capture this, this sort of bilobe structure and cross orientation and again, the, uh, the spatial locations. These types of functions I'm not quite uh, as happy with as to how they're, they're fitting, but you are getting some of the, this aspect where you have this collinearity in space and of a very specific uh, uh, orientation structure of multi-scale orientation structure. It's still pretty, pretty, good, uh, pretty good match there. So we had in the second layers uh, 600, about 600 or so functions in each, in each side of the model, 600 Ds, 600 Bs, and these are the, the correlation histograms that we get out. So you know, by and large, this, this very simple function that we've hypothesized in the second layer is doing a pretty good job of, of, uh, of matching the complicated model that we had to adapt to natural scenes and do all that unsurprised learning to, to achieve. There are a few, few types of functions that aren't, aren't learning so well. So this is like one of those, those functions that's doing a rotation in space. And so that's not, uh, not fitting quite as well. Um, there are some that, of these learned functions that are inseparable in the, uh, in the radius and the, and the orientation. So that might be another addition. And there are some functions that, that just mismatch. And these, these functions are likely due to temporal aliasing, actually, in the movies. So there's some, definitely some mismatches there and some uh, other possible um, different models proposed, or, or um, maybe just some functions that shouldn't be shouldn't be included here. So I think um, one of the nice things that could come out of this model here, this this very simple second layer Gabor function, are all the types of things that we saw from the first layer Gabor function. So we can, you know, provide it as a as a basis for learning um, the receptive fields of of neurons in single cell recordings or using them as bases to do fMRI uh, voxel decoding and encoding models. We can also 
begin to manipulate you know, images for psychophysics, whether we do detections or uh, perceptual learning type of uh, methodologies. And it would also be interesting to you know, begin to build these, these types of second layer Gabor functions into computational models. So just bake them in and begin to explore you know, higher level uh, aspects of computation. So I'm, I think I'm out of time. So I'm just gonna jump over this future directions and uh, well, you, you know, the contributions you just heard me talk about those. And some thanks to, to Bruno and the Redwood Center for, uh, for many contributions to this work. So, it's our discussion. We have time for questions. Yep. Um, Charles, one thing that makes it hard for physiologists to interpret what you're doing is, can you try to, so everything's in this generative framework where you're sort of talking about activity levels or you're sort of, you know, weights back on, um, on earlier weights that are in a generative process. So what you would call the inference process, I think, the other way around. I mean, can, can you just make plots of what you should see out of these so-called units? I mean, it wasn't clear to me how you were mapping some of these variables onto response levels at various neurons at different stages. That's hard to yeah. see from the plots you put up there. Maybe you don't even want to say what the <laughs> mapping is yet, but could you try to do that for us and tell us what? Um, well, well certainly, I, I, in the way I think about you know, these problems at large is that there's sort of two different axes. One is you know, what the variable should be and how they should be mapped to the neural data. So that's just by and large, but um, I think the work has been more fleshed out in terms of first layer models and, and like sparse coding like models. And so the natural thing there is that you have um, this, this feed forward um, process of information, which are just the, the dot products, the inner products between those, those bases and the, the input image. And then you have this, uh, this dynamical process, which is likely happening through lateral interactions to do like the sparsification or the inference process. And so by and large, you know, what you should probably see is that you get this big spike in the beginning and it didn't settles to some sort of um, you know, agreed upon uh, response level when all the neurons begin to communicate to each other. And the same type of a uh, process would happen then in the these second layers. So there's the, the process in, in between of, of how you might get out these like, complex uh, responses in the first layer. But again, in the second layer, you'd have this feed forward process, which would be Again, just the inner product of these, of these functions with the outputs of the first layer. And then you'd begin this, this feedback process, which not enough work has been done to, to really elaborate how that would, that would work in practice. So I don't know if that uh, probably doesn't answer the question. <laughs> it's just that the, the weights in that standard GLM would be, you know, the Gabor is the feed, it's modeled as the feed forward weights in the GLM. And here we're talking about Gabors on what I'm viewing as mm -hmm. back projecting weights onto activity levels. And I'm just trying mm -hmm. to understand, does that mean I have Gabor patterns of weights onto layer two? And if so, Gabors in what space? And that, that's hard for me to visualize in this sort of more feed forward yeah, architecture. So I, I think, um, so it may be that this inference process is happening, yet you can still use these GLM frameworks in order to do uh, predictions of single units. In, in V1. So even though that process is happening, it still does a, a decent job of, of showing you something, some correspondence between the actual neural response. But these additional aspects, the sort of around the borders of this, of this idea, are when this inferential process comes into play, where you have things like, um, and people have shown actually, things like end stopping and, and cross orientation inhibition that come out just from the, the d dynamical process of inference. And so when you begin to get around to uh, some additional aspects of this, of this process and, and things that are not linear in that, in that space, this inferential process is probably quite uh, critical to explaining some of those things, or at least it's a hypothesis to explain some of those things. And I imagine it's gonna carry on just as, just as it does in that first layer to these second layers, where we could begin to take you know, neurons in, in V2 and just use the GLM. So I could do the feed forward process of this model through those second layer Gabor functions and just use the GLM to predict the weights from, those, from this new basis. And th though it's likely though that there's some more dynamical process to those V2 neurons, we're not gonna explain everything, but maybe the inferential process might provide some, some new, um, you know, better correlations, for example. Do you really believe that the brain knows generative inference? I mean, there is a lot of this, not, so this criticism not 
with you, but there is a lot of mumbo jumbo about generative <laughs> processes, and it's a little bit like thermodynamics. If you use them mm -hmm. for information processing or for describing metaphors of how things could work, that's okay. But when you say that those uh, statistical models, generative or not, are also what the brain is doing, that's a big, big step. And mm -hmm. it seems very baroque to me that the brain or evolution could discover this complicated circuitry that you cannot even describe, right? Um, well, it's hard to argue with your beliefs. <laughs> but um, I mean, certainly I think it provides a very interesting hypothesis. And I think it, it's most relevant in things I haven't discussed actually today, but which are things like feedback. So. I think the, the generative framework is actually a very natural way to think about what feedback is doing in, in these models. For you, yes, for the brain of evolution, sure. Um, think about thermodynamics. Thermodynamics, right? It's a good example of a phenomenological model in physics, which was completely abstract. It was a metaphor. People don't, didn't know what heat was did a pretty good phenomenological description, helpful for experiments and so on, but mm -hmm. had nothing to do with actually, you know, heat and temperature and the physical basis of it. Hmm. Well, I mean, wouldn't a similar analogy apply then in generative models in the brain in that, well, I mean, well we it's had not the, actually a generative model see, when we get feedback from V2 okay, to V1, we had but it's neuron spiking and, and uh, you know, responses that are coming back to V1 to influence and manipulate the the dynamics within that V1 population. And you know, it may not be uh, mathematically the generative model, of course. I mean, because the generative model is just a mathematical equation. But the neurons are doing the spiking and the, this process. But it may, quite, it may be quite powerful to model and to understand that process of the feedback in the neural system by this generative framework. And I think this is an open hypothesis, actually. Maybe one that you won't pursue, but. <laughs> no. <laughs> Any other questions? I actually don't really understand Tommy's objection because it seems like uh, Charles, ha Charles and Bruno have a, a learning rule that's mm. as biologically plausible as any learning rule people have for these sorts of things that generates things that look like receptive fields that you actually see at intermediate stages of vision. And their learning rule happens to come from Bruno and Charles' philosophy about Gener the, the idea of generative models and the idea that the brain wants to represent the generative process of the world. But the fact is, all of that sort of philosophical and interpretational baggage is irrelevant to the fact that the learning rule produces plausible results. So I guess I don't really understand, Tommy, what your objection is. I mean, as it, there could be some other convergent learning rule, you know, convergent evolutionary pressures that create learning rules that end up having the same effect. and maybe for completely different evolutionary reasons, but in the end, if the brain ends up buying, in the end, or learning, uh, a model that happens to satisfy the generativity process property, that's just another benefit. It doesn't mean that this wouldn't work. Now, the fact that it's impossible to understand, well, I sympathize with Charles. I'm a neurophysiologist. Nobody can understand what I do either, so. It's Arrow, not Charles' wanna, fault. Arrow, do you want to chime in? Are you taking it literally, the generative model? Do you think, do you think that neurons are the feed, the feed no, my point is sending was it doesn't back matter. a prediction of what the, what the world is supposed to look like? No, I'm, I'm totally agnostic, right? Since I'm not a generative modeler, I don't have to subscribe to that religion. But I think <laughs> this say, is what this Jim look was like asking. A plausible You're a thing. physiologist like Jim, and this is what Jim was asking. How do I, I, thought, I make thought, sense of all this in terms of the physiology? Well, I thought Jim was asking actually a simpler question than, than Charles answered. I thought Jim was just asking, what the hell do these receptive fields actually look like? What should I look for? Yes. Can, you give me, can you basically just classify a bunch of receptive fields and tell me you should find these 10 classes of receptive fields? Here's a stimulation. Right, you just look for them. The go basis off and do functions it. are not receptive fields. In these models, right? You got to reverse so, them around. You got to so do something that, fancy. But that's why exactly. I'm saying, kind of, if, we, if you step back abstractly, we want to know: is this is this supposed to be <clears throat> something we take literally as what the brain is actually implementing? Or are we supposed to be thinking at a higher level of abstraction that this is just a, a way of of framing the problem and coming up with an answer that happens to look a bit like what the brain is doing? Yeah, this is a good um, It's more. Well, certainly the brain is spiking and has action potentials and does 
biochemistry no, and no, genetics. No, no, I mean, of course that. it's not doing that. We're, I'm so, not asking for that. But, level but, that of but I think my answer, though, is related to the spectrum of answers that, that you could have. And you can get up to you know, mathematical models that aren't even implemented and don't have um, you know, algorithmic aspects to them, even. You can get to, to models that have uh, you know, just graphical models. I mean, that's sort of where I'm operating at right now. And get down to models that actually have, are spiking and have, uh, you know, inhibitory and excitatory neurons, and you can go, you can keep on marching down the, this that, path. That's, and, that's fine, but if you, but if it's supposed to be a model that has predictive power, then you have to tell mm -hmm. us what the predictions are. Oh, right. okay. They, they so want you to close the, the loop. The predictions are and make that proposals the, for specific receptive fuel properties that yeah. a neurophysiologist with their primitive tools can find. That's what. Okay, they want. but now we're back to a yeah. list of those questions. Things. What so are the, the receptive fields that he's supposed to look for? So the predictions yeah. are that you take this basis instead of the V1 and Gabor basis, and you get better predictions. But the basis is not. The, the basis are, is not the receptive fields. Right, so... No, but he's saying if you use this basis to fit receptive fields, you should get a better answer by some criterion of better, meaning mm -hmm. either better predictions or a sparser so, answer with the same predictions. You're right, I'm, but, I'm, but, I'm ignoring but the, Jim, the generative Jim versus... and Arrow are asking for something stronger, which is they want things you can show to the cell. They want you to generate ah. things you can show to the cell that will verify that your model works. They, they want you to find the set of stimuli that discriminate between your model and all other models in the universe. Okay, well... With a small set that, <laughs> that may be more difficult. But, uh, well, but that, that, that's, that's exactly what, it, not all of the models in the universe, but let's say a parsimonious model, like uh -huh. a feed forward and or operator class of models, right, that Tommy presented, right? So that's a sort of standard view, uh -huh. so you want to compete against that. that that's at the level yeah, of measurement, yeah, and that's, yeah, that's essentially what I'm, what I'm asking for. And if it certainly. competes better, that would be evidence that this way of thinking mm -hmm. is uh, maybe more useful going forward. That's mm -hmm. essentially it. Um, that, that was the answer, though, right? <laughs> well, uh, you wanted the methodological procedure. I mean, I think this is, you know, this is like up to sort of future work and, and how this actually transpires. But, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, there's, there's many possible enumerations here, whether you just take the feed-forward account of, of this model and we'll ignore the, the inferential and, uh, and generative aspects of it, but we'll take those those um, receptive fields, just use them as their feed-forward uh, responses. And that can create a, a space where we can measure things like you know, similarity between um, uh, this space and the similarity of the voxel, voxel spaces people are doing. We can do GLMs, again, in that space to uh, regress against individual neural responses. We can also do other methodologies where we can use this as a generative model and produce stimuli. And I haven't, I don't know exactly how um, you do invalidate or look in, and see what the neural responses should be given those generative models and, and how to actually pit them against uh, different, different models. I mean, that's a really an important part. So to the degree that um, some, with your thinking, some part of the brain is calculating the space of set for describing motion, then it seems like um, that basis set is very relevant to the question of what the static image analysis part of the brain should be looking for in terms of invariances, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, like when Tommy gave his talk, he said, he told us we should look for translational invariance, rotational invariance, et cetera. But it seems like if we knew what the typical motions are in the world, we mm -hmm. should be looking for invariance with respect to these typical motions, right? Yeah, so, yeah, certainly. So question is, do you or anybody in this room have a picture of how those two parts of the brain talk to each other to train each other? Well, this model gives, gives uh, an inkling of what those solutions might look like. And so the, again, through the generative process, there's inference that goes on, and the, the two sides of the model are actually not independent in the, in the inferential process. So they need to talk to one another, and they talk to, to one another through that first layer, and in some other experiments, I can show how you know that first layer is, is manipulated uh, based on plausible hypotheses of motion from that that second layer, and then that will then in turn influence the form pathway as well, because we can in noisy situations especially it's very easy to show these types of things, where you have multiple hypotheses more or less, and you want to disambiguate them, and and motion will then provide a strong constraint on what the possible form can be. 
That's all I have for now, though. <laughs> Maybe someone else has, a, has an answer. <laughs>